folks so welcome or welcome back to Fable from friday for the first case for this week we are going to kansas city this case is said like a pretty well-known case um i don't remember the, um this case going on because the year that our victim died was literally the same year that i was born so our victim's like four years older than me so if anybody is from like the kansas city area or you were living there and around like 2001 early 2000s specific uh ask them if they remember this case uh, I'm gonna give what's publicly well known down. I'm gonna give what is publicly known. Sources down below as always. Thoughts are always welcome. I'm gonna quit my rambling and let's go and get started. So Erica Michelle Marie Green was born on May 15th, 1997. Her mother Michelle was in jail for a larceny, and her father uh, Larry was also in jail, but didn't specify what what he was in jail for. Uh, the mother Michelle she was born on January 2nd, 1975. In 1992, she Michelle had apparently failed to protect her children from child abuse. And then in 1993, there was a child that she gave birth to that apparently tested po positive for cocaine. And at the time of Erica's birth, which again was 1997, so like four years later, she was under investigation because there was a fourth child that she had that she gave birth to that tested positive for cocaine. So Michelle and Larry apparently had like five kids together, but Michelle just by herself had like eight kids. That's best about how many kids Larry has because I guess like it didn't matter. Um, it was... The sources were worried about him. We're worried about Michelle, and you'll see why. Like, why if we keep on going? Um. So then, of course, like I said, Michelle's in jail, so obviously she can't watch Erica. So she reaches out to apparently Larry's grandmother. So then Larry's grandmother apparently gets in contact with one of her uh, one of her friends, and this friend's name is called Be uh, Betty Brown. Didn't specify the exact age, but it says like she was she was almost seventy at the time she's over here taking care. of of this newborn baby, but apparently she happily took Erica in while Michelle was in jail. So then Michelle apparently gets released when Erica's like five months old. Betty apparently would drive Michelle to go stay at a family member's house. And you would think that she would take Erica with her because, you know, you just got released from prison. But no, she, um, she was, Erica was staying in the custody of Betty. So I guess that's an agreement that they had. And of course, that being her child, she would, of course, occasionally visit, but wouldn't stay long. So in April of 2001, around like Easter, um, Michelle comes to Betty saying, hey, I want to go take Erica for a family reunion. Betty, of course, hesit hesitated because, you know, like, I've pretty much raised this girl since the moment she was born. And you ain't really been active in your own child's life. Like, why you want to take her now? But, like, legally, like, Betty couldn't say, like, no, because that is, like, her child. So, she hesitated but did give it, did give Erica to Michelle, unfortunately not knowing that was the last time she would ever see. So then, um, around the time that she comes to pick up Erica for this uh, alleged family reunion... Michelle has this new boyfriend named Harold Johnson. Apparently, he has his own daughter. He was born September 7th, 1979. So, Erica, Michelle, Harold, and his daughter, which the daughter's not named because, you know, she's a minor. She is, she's completely innocent. So, you see why her name's left out. They all go to Kansas City, Missouri, and they're staying at a cousin of Harold. And then apparently, at some point during the night, the two adults, Michelle and Harold, are doing drugs. So, of course, Michelle uh, returns to the area where, uh, you know, Miss Betty was staying at. And Betty, understandably, was like, hey, uh, you know, where's Erica at? Because apparently, Miss Betty had a whole uh, Easter outfit ready for Erica because, you know, again, it was around Easter. She had the outfit laid out, you know, ready for her when she came back. Not knowing, of course, that she's not going to come back. But, you know, of course, she, obviously, you wouldn't think that, think that what happened would happen. So, then we're going to fast forward to April 28th, still 2001. And apparently there's a neighbor who calls uh, police for like a welfare check because there's this elderly man who apparently had wandered off. And obviously he's elderly, he's vulnerable. Can y'all like find the man? Luckily, the elderly man is found safe. However, while apparently during the search for the elderly man, somebody finds Erica's decapped head body. So then on May 1st, only a couple of days later, um, Erica's head is then found in a trash can. There's an ashtray. Apparently the man that led police to... Her head apparently had a dream about a decapitated head. Understandably, the police are trying to make sure that, like, you were not involved. Because, you know, understandably, for all we know, it could have been you. And you, you just have a guilty conscience. And you try to make yourself look innocent. Uh, he's apparently found to be cleared pretty soon. There's no DNA on the ashtray. And Erica is labeled as precious dough because at the time, they didn't know it was Erica. As you can imagine, uh, this little girl's body is found de decapitated. Obviously, the city is shocked. Uh, there's money raised, flyers are made, I assume, to try to figure out the identity of this little girl. Um, a f her, she would get a funeral where over 200 people were attended, and it's actually said that Michelle attended this funeral. 
couldn't confirm that, but it said that she attended it. And then apparently the lead investigator, his family, like when they, when it was time for them to eat dinner every night, he would have a play out for Erica as a reminder so he would never forget Erica until she is, at least until she is identified. So the story of Precious Doe gets put on America's Most Wanted. So not just in the Kansas City area, but like we got to put all over the country because we don't know this girl could have came from literally anywhere in the country, right? And then in 2002, Michelle and Harold actually got married. So then fast forward 2005, a whole four years later, Harold's grandfather, Thurman McIntosh, he apparently calls uh, the police and says, hey, I think that my step-granddaughter is Precious Doe. And they're like, what makes you think that? Because also they're taking this case very seriously because you know, it's a child. Harold apparently told Thurman that Michelle knows things about me that could put me in jail for life. And he ain't seen Erica in a while. And apparently he's overheard the two of them talk about Precious Doe. And apparently he's like, hey, that kind of does look like her. Uh, she's about the same age that Erica would be, so... When he told him that statement, apparently they were both in jail for unrelated... So not, obviously, for, like, the murder of Erica, but they were in jail for, like, unrelated things. Um, Harold would eventually get released, and then Michelle eventually gets released, apparently, after him for their unrelated charges. So then, of course, Harold is demanding to know, like, what the hell does Michelle know that could put you in jail for life? Because life, that's, like, murder, you know? And so... And this is... You know, Thurman is overconnecting dots, basically, as he should. And apparently, Harold says to Michelle, in front of Thurman, why did you tell Grandpa? So then, like I said, there's a sketch, and there was a mold that was made of what, like, Erica should have looked like. It doesn't really look like her, but again, they're trying their best. So, you know, you can't really blame them. It's the early 2000s. They ain't got the materials like we do today. You gotta give them credit for what they was trying to do for this, girl, this baby. So then, Thurman... He sends us a picture. He sends in a picture, but it's not if Erica apparently is one of her cousins, but apparently he thought it was her. You know, it's a mistake. He's trying to help. He's doing the right thing. Uh, so I don't know how the guy did a uh, hair sample of Michelle's B did. But you think about it, it makes sense because that is her mom. So it should come back as, as like somewhat of a match. So like, yes, this is your child. Because you know. Right. And so by the time apparently they both are arrested again on warrants. Uh, she admits that she was apparently high on PCP, and the night that Erica died, apparently she went to the bathroom and then came out and saw Erica standing up, and apparently before she went in, she told Erica to basically go lay down go to bed because apparently it was late. And so she asked Harold, like, you know, why is Erica, like, up? And he would tell her that, you know, I told her to stay up. And then, again, this is before they got married. So then Michelle's like, uh, my child's my child, your child, because Harold has... Harold has his own kid that obviously he doesn't have an Erica. He had with another woman. That's your child. So like, stay, let me do, let me manage my child. You manage yours, essentially. So then Harold is apparently said to have kicked her in the head. Uh, as you can imagine, that's a pretty hard kick. And again, she's like four years old. So apparently she becomes unconscious. Apparently Eric, Michelle takes her to the bathroom. Uh, tries, you know, put the water on her face and to like wake her up. It ain't working. Apparently both of them are aware they have the warrants for like the unrelated things that I mentioned earlier. So they take her to the park the next day in a stroller with some hedge clippers, ashtrays, which is why there's an ashtray found with her, and some black bags. So then it, Harold is, apparently is the one who decapitated her, but Erica was the one who removed her clothing because she was found naked, so she couldn't be identified because apparently there's cases where people were identified because of the clothes they were wearing. And then after the police are told the story by Michelle, they apparently show what I assume is Erica's deceased body to her to verify this is in fact your daughter before I come to the public because the public is going to want to know who this child is because it's been four years and I just want to verify this is your daughter before we go to the public with this so she verifies it Harold says um Erica was actually alive for two whole days be after I kicked her but the autopsy shows that apparently Erica was beaten multiple times with the ashtray so they're disposing of the ashtray because that's what essentially beat her essentially and that she was kicked multiple times Shell. Michelle gets 25 years because she testifies against Harold. So, you know, got the little plea deal. And Harold, since apparently he's the one that kicked her and that's believed to be what eventually Eric her out. Like, that was a fatal blow, essentially. Um, he gets life without parole. And then Harold would, of course, appeal their sentence, as a lot of these cases do, basically saying that he was coerced and didn't get a fair trial. And, of course, that's obviously that was a nod because, like, he's still in jail to this day. So then 2010... Um, Larry, which was Erica's biological father, even though he was not in the picture, he went and sued, apparently, the state of Oklahoma, 
basically saying that y'all just let Betty up come in there and like take take Erica. And I thought maybe it was because of her age, because again she was in her like if not already in her seventies, she was approaching seventy essentially. No, apparently just because she was a random person, she only had to sign one sheet of paper, did not have a background check. For all we know, she could she could have potentially killed Erica one day. Because that's a genuine concern. I will give him that. And so Oklahoma agreed, and they made it a law where basically if you get birth in prison in Oklahoma at least. Your child's going straight to DHS instead of just a random person. I don't know what the policy is. If they're family, Betty, because Betty Brown, as far as we know, was not related to Erica whatsoever. Because like I said, she was, she was a maternal grandmother's friend. So no biological relation between the two that we know of. And so then, of course, Larry, this is the part I'm like, Larry did wind up getting like an undisclosed amount of money. But we don't know how much he got. Could have been a lot, could have been a little, but it's not legally publicly disclosed. So, Yeah. And then, uh, sadly, that same year, still 2010, on March 13th, Thurman would sadly die at 86. And so, yeah, that is, let us, ugh. that is what is publicly known about the case of Precious Doe. If you know anybody that's involved in the case, definitely let me know. Um, if anybody happened to have served in the same prison as, um, Michelle or Harold, preferably Michelle, definitely let me know. Uh, are they getting treated good? Which, I mean, obviously, you killed a child and the case is pretty well known so i can imagine you know life in prison not doing pretty good but you know always try to hear like people who knew of our victim or our killer definitely let me know uh definitely your thoughts down below what do you think of betty thurman everybody involved in the story i'm actually recording this may 14th so if erica was still alive her birthday would be tomorrow so happy heavenly birthday i guess happy early heavenly birthday to Erica, uh, may she rest in peace, of course, because, you know, she's the most innocent party out of all of this, because, you know, she was only four, didn't deserve what happened to her. And so, with that being said, I cover Fatal Females three times a week, subscribe more Fatal Females, and I'll see you with the next one. Bye!